Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alan Plattis from the uh, School of Architecture at Yale. And as we begin, I'd like to thank uh, our colleagues, Asha and her gang at the uh, School of the Environment for hosting this and bringing uh, by the miracle of Zoom, uh, Peter Calthorpe to Yale, or I should say back to Yale. Now, I'm not going to read Peter's CV as an introduction. You can all do that on your own. Uh, although I will mention uh, that Peter operates now as part, a uh, key part, uh, principle uh, of a uh, big multidisciplinary and international uh, design firm, HDR. Uh, and he can tell you more. Uh, I'm going to tell a short story about Peter. Uh, uh, which positions Peter in a limited way. He is free to reposition himself, of course. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when Peter and I first met. Uh, I had just left Yale uh, for parts unknown uh, as he arrived in the mid 70s. Uh, but uh, I really got to know him and his ideas and work uh, during the early years of the Congress for the New Urbanism. By the time of the official first meeting, uh, of that Congress in Alexandria, Virginia, I think, Peter, in 1993, it was already clear to many of us that the unified front, which was then being presented uh, to the world, uh, partly repressed at least two significantly different directions, which might be said to correspond to both geography and focus. The most visible and vocal uh, people, projects, and position were centered then in Florida where a group of Ivy League expats had seen the light of new urbanism, courtesy of Leon Creer and in righteous opposition to the developer sprawl, which was eating both coastal real estate in Florida and the Everglades alive at an alarming pace. In a brilliant act of detournement, uh, they embraced the unit of planning and development uh, and, um, uh, and, and shooed um, uh, the uh, actual form that was then preferred by developers. But there was another mostly friendly faction in the early days of CNU that included a cohort of almost equally ivy covered young architects who had already come together in the emergence of an early recognizably green movement within architecture. 
this group tended to be based or had migrated to the West Coast, particularly the Bay Area and specifically Berkeley, where Peter is today. Uh, and when they undertook projects, they tended to be for the public sector, not for commercial developers. Although ultimately that wing of the movement produced its own new generation of green developers like Peter's brother-in-law, Jonathan Rose, who I gather is speaking at YSE soon. Uh, but I saw Peter uh, then and now as having been the leader of that, uh, do I dare say progressive wing of the CNU party. Although even then one can see in retrospect, he was not really focused on party politics. In spite of a few provocative and important debates like the one he once had with Andres Dewani over urban growth boundaries, Peter was in favor. Uh, Peter always had, it seemed to me, his eye and his work squarely focused on bigger issues than architectural style and the production of self-contained neighborhood scale projects. He saw that the real battle against sprawl and its disastrous environmental, public health, and social justice consequences would not be won by projects, however pretty and green. Uh, at the time, I tended to call such projects low tar uh, cigarettes. Uh, but uh, Peter, quite rightly, in my view, uh, saw that environmental design must be positioned and fought uh, at the scale of the region and at the level of policy as well as design as you'll no doubt see from his work today. His CV, if you wanna glance there, is chock full of publications, projects, awards all over the world now that recognize his ongoing contributions and leadership in this effort. And it is a real pleasure to welcome him uh, virtually back to Yale where he was briefly a student and is now even from afar an important teacher and inspiration, Peter. Alan, thank you so much. Uh, yes, there's always been uh, polarities in, in just about every field, and this one included. Uh, I did stand, I started with the environmental movement, not, uh, and I only dabbled in architecture. I wasn't so good, so I stuck to the things I really were passionate about, which was the, the consequence of urban form on the environment and on the well-being of human beings, and that really is what's driven me uh, throughout my career. I'm going to go right to slides because of course I put too many in, but I think people actually like to see details and, and examples as opposed to postulates and uh, global statements. So let's see if I can get to share screen here. 
Uh, yeah, am I shared? Hold shift. Okay, is it sharing now? Yeah, okay. Yes. And then I'll just go to full view and we'll go starting with this multidisciplinary uh, firm, amazing firm, which expresses one of my preliminary postulates, which is it takes lots of different skill sets to create the right kind of plan. It has to range across issues in many, many ways. This, I promise, will be my last book. It's a work that we're doing with HDR for the World Bank called Ending Glo Global Sprawl. After working with World Bank on many projects, I discovered that they didn't have a unified set of metrics or benchmarks with which to even think about how to make the major investments in, in infrastructure and economic development across most of the third world. Uh, it was all piecemeal and basically off the shelf paradigms. So I began questioning it and they invited me to write a book, which this is a overview of. Uh, I won't belabor the issue of how important cities are. They are the future of mankind in terms of our potential. Uh, they are the greatest challenge we have. We cannot solve climate change without resilient, healthy cities. We cannot create a more equitable society and we cannot even begin with the background of my dogs uh, to um, uh, create uh, ecological environments that are truly sustainable. 70% of the planet uh, population will be in cities and a lot of that growth is happening outside the United States. So the task was, are there any universal postulates, uh, benchmarks? Uh, that go to healthy urban form. And I think there are, I will end with eight of them, but I'm gonna start with the taxonomy of urbanism that I see in the world as I work. Uh, and they are three forms of sprawl that have been afflicting the planet since about 1950 um, in both the developed world and the developing the global South. The largest of course is low income sprawl. It, as people arrive from countryside to seek the benefits of urbanization, education, sanitation, civic, hospitals, uh, they tend to land in inopportune locations, at the periphery, in uh, self-made environments. There's another variety of sprawl, which is practiced by China, but by itself represents a very big part of the global urban trend. Uh, which is the old super block and tower mentality. And so even though it's highly dense, it has all the negative attributes of sprawl in which people are separated from one another, from local destinations and from uh, larger cultural opportunities. And then of course, the one we're all familiar with, and I'll start with this one. I'm gonna give you examples of all three of these types of sprawl and their antidotes. Um, I call our sprawl high income, and it is globally. It's only affordable to a very wealthy category of people in the history of mankind. And of course it is uh, uh, not something that can be replicated. And certainly if it is replicated, the demise of the planet is clearly imminent. Uh, but it's failing on many, many levels. Um, and we see it as a housing crisis here in California. Um, we have a deficit. We cannot build enough new housing to satisfy the workforce, the middle and lower middle income households. And if you can't satisfy the a need for housing at that level, you certainly have affordable housing in crisis and of course, homelessness. But it all comes from the fact that our paradigm for housing, which is ever more distant subdivision, uh, has completely failed. As a matter of fact, when you look at 2008, uh, they call it the financial crisis, but actually it was the housing crisis. Um, the foreclosures all take place. This is a map of Chicago in 1998, um, prior to uh, the fiscal crisis, the Great Recession. Uh, and then in 2008, during the recession, and you'll note, and this is rarely noted, that most of the foreclosures are in distant suburban areas, not in uh, good, healthy 
urban areas. Uh, what it really manifests is the collapse of affordability. The distance of traveling and transportation can take 15 to 20% of household income, along with the cost of the housing, 30 to 40%. Those two things alone are what drive the economic well being of working people in this country. And they could no longer afford this type of housing. And therefore, because the inventory was there, it had to be gimmicked in its financing. This is my take on uh, the, the, the big recession. So let's look a little more carefully at the way we shape regions and what kind of elements are in region. In my region, we have distant suburbs, which are absolutely standard. We have historic streetcar suburbs, which were intrinsically mixed and walkable, but not as dense as San Francisco. And the differences are stunning. You can see it, we all know it. The San Ramon in the, in the distant suburbs, leapfrog uh, subdivisions and office parks and shopping malls, everything built around the asphalt and the car. The old historic streetcar suburbs always had main streets, always had mixed use and always had diverse housing so that they allowed uh, apartments on the corners and bungalows on the streets. That rich mix is actually the scale at which I think we can lean into for solutions in this category. And then of course, San Francisco is not a particularly dense city by any calibration, um, but of course it is a city and it, it operates very differently. We can, we can understand the impacts of these three living environments across one region, uh, whether it's carbon emissions, which is a three and a half X difference between living in San Francisco and living out in the suburbs, land consumption even more, household vehicle miles traveled, which turn into everything bad, congestion, air quality impacts, um, a cost for individual households, and then other metrics. So we understand the differences and we can now actually study the impacts of more or less of each, which we were asked to do by the state of California. Um, they wanted us to look at two futures for the state. Call, and, and I'll dumb it down because it's a it's very complex study with lots of numbers, but there was trend, which was more sprawl, uh, more solving the housing crisis by ever farther subdivisions. And there was compact, which was infill and redevelopment, which I'll get into in a little bit of depth. This is LA under the sprawl future for 2050. This is LA with the same population in 2050 under the compact scenario. Both completely viable as built form and, econ and quite frankly, economically more viable in the com compact form. But we can easily calculate the difference, the startling difference in um, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is just for building energy and passenger vehicles. There are other dimensions, of course, to what produces carbon and climate change. But these two alone um, reflect a vast majority of what California has to deal with in terms of carbon. Land consumption, whether it's eco ecological domains or agriculture, um, the difference between these two futures is stunning. And what's important about these numbers is that they represent different political interest groups, each of which in a coalition of shared interests around urbanism uh, can actually make a big policy shift. So the, this is the one that I'm more focused on now, the affordability issue. Look at the difference, a, a $10,000 a year saving in a more compact, urban environment than in a traditional suburban environment. Uh, that, that's on a median household income of around 50,000. So this is, a, this is a really big number when it comes. And this is the systemic differences. We tend to try to deal with affordable housing with subsidies and one-off projects or um, uh, household income with tax uh, gimmicks. But the reality is we just need a, an intrinsically more sustainable lifestyle, which will be kind to the environment and also affordable to working people all over the world. So let's look at this housing crisis in the Bay Area. From 2010 to 18, we created almost 900,000 jobs and we only built a little more than 100,000 units of housing. 
we're exporting uh, the workforce for the Silicon Valley out into the Central Valley and exporting them into a life dedicated to long, longer and longer commutes and all the environmental impacts. What's the solution? Well, I started thinking about the fact that Amazon has pretty much wiped out all the strip commercial property, right? We don't go to uh, small uh, uh, retail centers on uh, six lane arterials. So I took, a, I did an experiment. Uh, I looked at El Camino, which is uh, just 43 miles from San Francisco to Silicon Valley through the heart of Silicon Valley. And I wondered how much land was available if you just converted um, the strip commercial. So there's, we all know this, this is everywhere USA. It's in the heart of every community. It's the worst part of every community. What if we rehabilitated this and turned these gray fields into the solution, into the place where the next generation of housing could be built in a way that allowed transit and mixed use to thrive in every community. So we started painting a picture of that. This is using urban footprint, looking at floodplain and fire hazard. So this particular strip is very well positioned. Uh, the red parcels are the commercial parcels. These are undervalued now, of course, and they, they will continue to decline as online shopping and commerce uh, continues to dominate the environment. This is residual land in the heart of our communities and the place where we can bring about the greatest change. So here's El Camino itself in all its glory, the center of Silicon Valley. On the right, you know you're in a good place when you can't tell the difference between a building and a parking structure. Um, and this is what it easily could be. It's 120 feet, has enough space for generous sidewalks, bikeways, yes, God save me, still six lanes of traffic, but also next generation transit. It all fits and all the land around it can convert very easily. So I'm just trying to paint a picture of a very practical solution to our housing, to our transportation, uh, to our housing affordability issue, and also to our environmental challenge. Um, and so the answer came back. A quarter million homes on that one street could be built just using that land. And by the way, you can see the numbers on the right, water use, energy use, driving, greenhouse gas, transportation costs, everything comes down as people move into more central locations where they're closer to the the uh, epicenter of employment and where they can walk to many local services. We then were asked to look at the whole Bay Area. Uh, they said, okay, well, that's interesting, a quarter million. How much do you get in five counties? And the answer was 1.2 million units of housing on 15,000 acres. And this is the kind of housing that we're used to. It's everything from a townhouse to a, um, uh, a mid-rise building next to a BART station or a transit station. Lots of variety, lots of parcel size difference. And interestingly enough, a, not a big, you know, new town solution, not a freestanding community on a green field, but a distributed solution that adds economic value to all the communities and creates uh, and transforms what were the worst place in the community into the best. So did the same analysis and lo and behold, if the Bay Area grew on these boulevards, um, uh, we could save all, all sorts of uh, environmental hazards. But how are you gonna move people around? If we're densifying these core communities rather than spreading outward, how do you handle the mobility problem? We have a backbone system of BART and, and Caltrain, um, but when you add these boulevards and you imagine that every boulevard has a new, what I call uh, autonomous rapid transit, the next generation of BRT, bus rapid transit, all of a sudden you have a network that gets everywhere, takes you everywhere, and is at the doorstep of most people, unlike the transit networks we have today in the suburbs. We know globally that bus rapid transit is the most cost effective and you need dedicated lanes because if they're running in the same traffic, uh, these buses are gonna be just as unattractive uh, as they could be. 
what's fascinating now in China, they have autonomous rapid transit buses. It's beginning to step in the right direction, interestingly enough. But I think there's something even more interesting, which is these uh, autonomous vans. If they had, if they ran on uh, singular right of ways, they could transform this environment. This is once again, a little picture of El Camino Real into this environment where you would go to a station and you'd put in your destination and a van would stop maybe once or twice fill up and go direct to destination. Every trip would be a um, express journey. And therefore the average speed of the transit goes up, the operations and maintenance costs comes way down, right? Because a vast majority of transit costs are in drivers and the construction costs comes way down. This is all in comparison to light rail systems. Now you're looking at the guy who would coined the phrase uh, transit oriented development and advocated for light rail for decades. I don't think we can afford light rail anymore. We need ubiquitous transit and therefore it has to be affordable everywhere. And the interesting thing is we have the place, we have the space and we're gonna have the technology very soon. As a matter of fact, these vans will be operating quicker than autonomous cars because they're in a more controlled environment. So that's a kind of exciting, this is one dimension of the work I'm focused on now that most excites me. Um, but let's go to China, because we don't live in a world that, that is a mirror image of our lives. Uh, and, you know, in this effort of China to uh, bring the world to the old Villa Radius paradigm of super blocks, giant freeways and towers, um, they kind of played it out and they've discovered after, I think Beijing is now on its seventh uh, ring road, seven of them. Um, and they're still in complete gridlock. There is no city in this picture. There is no viable future in this picture. And finally, we got it figured out. This is what they've been building. And I have to say that they have brought 800 million people out of rural poverty. And when people arrive in what we look at as monotonous barracks, they are euphoric. They have running water and heat. They have light and air, as the old modernists say. They have schools, they have clinics, they have community centers, they have senior centers. Um, the social fabric, the network of social support in this is astounding. They also have economic opportunity. Uh, it is the path that they use to get to a middle-class society. And they have leapfrogged into becoming a middle-class society. And it's on the back of pretty bad urbanism. So they are uh, open to new forms of urbanism and that's the work I've been doing there for 15 years now. Of course, the roads which used to be all bicycles are now death traps for anybody who's not four wheel. Um, this is in a super block, look at this environment. No sidewalks, no ground floor shops. It's an environment designed for cars. And it turns out that only 30% of the population in China can afford to own a car. So there's this mismatch between who the culture is made of and how the technology and mobility happens. This is a, a true rendering of a city grid in um, Chongqing, uh, where these are just the super blocks of housing and then these massive roads. If you put a road every half mile, by necessity, it has to be very, very large. And so this is this landscape of isolation that we were trying to create the antidote. And we demonstrated that that transformation that I just showed you results in exactly the same amount of urban, uh, of development potential and actually less asphalt and better mobility. And so these two things going from this to this was a proposition that we made. Uh, they gave us eight cities to work in and when we finished, they said they adopted all the principles that we had articulated, one of which being small blocks. So I'll give you an example of one of the cities, Chongqing. The study area here is uh, for population four and a half million. Um, it's surrounded by development. So you could say it's not so much a greenfield, but it really is. Uh, the outrageous uh, assumption was that you start with the natural environment and you understand it before you do any planning. 
And so this idea of protecting riparian corridors and, and hillsides and major river embankments uh, is a first in China. They, don't, they normally bulldoze their way to anything and everything. Uh, but starting with nature was our first proposition. That's existing development. These are the highway networks. Um, and these then become these districts where I thought if you were on a bicycle, you should be able to move through it without ever uh, coming across a freeway or um, a barrier. In other words, mobility for two wheels and two feet. This is the transit network, the metro system they put in place with quarter, uh, quarter mile radius around each one. So when you live in a country where they're willing to invest in the kind of infrastructure that everyday people need, i.e. robust transit networks, you can get a complete coverage like that. So this is the kind of master plan for this 450 million odd people. And then they said, well, show us what it looks like on an individual site. So this uh, ULI eco city was born. And it looks something like this. The grid is gone, which is just um, a conceit, really. It's, you can do it with a grid, you can do it. But this is a very topographic area. And part of the, the philosophy was work with the natural grades as opposed to pretend they don't exist. This was the before on the left, and it's all residential in one area, all industrial super blocks in another. And this is the integrated uh, mixed use alternative that's now under construction. Um, one of the more profound elements was not just the green setbacks from the river, which became riverfront parks and sports areas, but also a series of green streets. If only 30% of the people have cars, why should 100% of streets allow cars? Why not have them be car free? Um, and so that network connected the community to these grander open spaces. This is one of our renderings of one of these auto free streets, transit, bikeways, pedestrian environments, and much higher densities than we get to build in most places in the United States. But at these densities and with these auto ownership ratios, this kind of environment really makes sense. And then just a step back to look at the environmental side of this, uh, treasuring the water way itself. Um, each city block here is about 100 meters by 100 meters. So it's small enough to be unique, each one unique with its own private courtyard. It is a European model of uh, the street, the building and the courtyard as the fundamental building block of the urbanism in a place like this. Now I'll talk a little bit about low income sprawl. I'm not doing so poorly on time. I'm two thirds of the way done. Um, but this is the, the most challenging of course because the economics are so difficult. People move from countryside to city for economic opportunity. Um, and they typically, it is a path up and out of poverty. But the path involves some pretty uh, painful steps, and one of which is the uh, favelas. This is a, a picture of Mexico City where we did a regional plan. These are two images. One is social housing at the periphery. The other one is informal housing, self-built. Now, self-built communities are much more interesting, much cooler places. These are the social housing, which is subsidized, is, is uh, pretty sterile. But they share one thing in common. They're both way out on the fr urban fringe. And because of that, the average commute is like three hours each way for many working people in these lower income suburbs. Uh, and there is no sufficient transit network. As a matter of fact, they have um, their private bus systems, which lead to complete chaos on the road. So we started our analysis, where, uh, where do people live? And of course the poor people all live at the periphery. The dark areas are the center of the historic city. That's where the wealthy live. It is the inverse of what we did in the United States where the wealthy left the city uh, to the poor and now have returned back in many cases. But this fundamental structure 
of uh, low-income populations at the periphery is normative around the developing world. And here's where the jobs are, job concentration. So the wealthy get to near, live not only near the historic resources and the cultural resources of the city, but also near the economic resource at the center. And the poor are off in the periphery. So this fundamental mismatch is the challenge of the developing world, I believe. We mapped out uh, domains of mobility. Uh, the best being, of course, that you could walk and you could use transit and you had transit. Well, lo and behold, that was the center of the city and that's where the wealthy were. There were a second tier where there was transit but very little walkability and there, that was a couple of these new lines. Uh, a, a third where it was walkable but no transit, which is pretty large component, 26%. But then there was this two thirds majority of the city where there was no transit of consequence and no walkability. So it's, um, you know, it's interesting how you can now begin to layer a city in its economic and social and mobility patterns. I'm not gonna go into this one in great detail, but this is our methodology when we work at this scale is to do scenarios and then compare the scenarios across a range of metrics. So each scenario has a strategy for land, for location of infill, uh, employment, um, uh, quantity of transit investments, and type of urbanism. And so each scenario is a mix of those four variables. And of course, the one that wins always, and I'm sad to have to do it over and over again because it seems so obvious, is that if you have good walkable urbanism, you have a healthy transit network and you have a jobs housing balance and you tend to build within the urban growth boundary, all of a sudden you have a successful community and the community succeeds. And these are the metrics, land consumption, infrastructure, energy, water, uh, travel, uh, v VKT, uh, time in travel um, and a couple others that I can't see right now and cost per household and greenhouse gas emissions. The reason we lay it out this way is that we see that politically, uh, let's see, I may have to go back. There is uh, politics in combining different special interest groups. Some people are interested in affordable housing, some in climate change, some in water rights, others in household costs, um, travel time, there, we all live in these silos and we're trained in silos uh, to think in one dimension. But cities operate in many silos simultaneously and they're all interactive. It offers the opportunity for coalition building that can bring about real change. And this plan to uh, you know, the normal uh, degree of political um, decay has been adopted for Mexico City. Uh, they know that more growth at the periphery is death um, for that city. And finally, I think this is the last project I'll show you. Ho Chi Minh City, I put in for Alan because Alan's been working on the same topics of flood prone uh, jurisdictions. And this is a project for the World Bank uh, to define a sustainable and resilient city path. Of course, the same picture emerges all over the globe, which is massive sprawl. Vietnam is, economy is moving upward and it's moving upward largely because of Ho Chi Minh City in the south, but you can see the sprawl. What's interesting is in, in 1990, the city was compact and largely on high ground in terms of uh, this delta and the flood prone crisis that it's confronting now. And then of course, as you see, 2015 is spread well into all those domains. Uh, and I'll drill down a little bit more. Flooding is common all the time in much of the city. Uh, this is a map showing in light orange existing development in flood prone areas or floodable areas. Uh, and the dark uh, uh, color is where their current master plan uh, designates new growth. So it's kind of a tragic image of 
getting it wrong and then doubling down on getting it wrong. Uh, of course, they hired uh, Western engineers to solve the problems for them. Oh, wait a minute, one little factoid here. McKinsey recently did a study looking at impact on infrastructure in 2050. And it's just painful to read that here is a place that's scrambling out of poverty only to be inundated in ways that are gonna negate its economic advance uh, through just plain blindness. No, you know what? It's not blindness. What's going on here? Why, are, why is uh, this city filling out in lowland? Because a lot of it is informal housing and the wealthy come and they, uh, they land in high ground just like they did in New Orleans. Uh, and the, uh, the poor arrive and build their own shanty in low ground. And since about 70% of the housing in the city is self-built, a very large percentage of the housing is in flood prone areas. Because the engineers from uh, uh, the Danish engineers showed up and with their standard solution, which is you build dikes this is, uh, you can see these big ring dikes that run around the city. And then of course, once you've built those, you have to maintain them. And then because there's such a large in, uh, input of water from the uplands, you have to pump it, continually pump it. And of course it doesn't arrest the decay of the amazing um, uh, mangrove wetlands to the south. Our solution is pretty simple and it's right obvious to anybody who looks at it. Area A and area B is high ground. And that's where growth should be directed. As a matter of fact, redevelopment, people who now live in low lying areas could easily be moved. And that's something that happens in China all the time. Um, but this migration from the South to these two Northern sites uh, are kind of obvious and, and yet politically very unpopular because so much investment has gone into um, development in low, low lying areas. So that's proposition one, just develop in the right place. Proposition two is design a low carbon transport system. Now this one's really interesting to me. 90% uh, of trips are on two wheels in this city. And two wheels turn out to be incredibly efficient, but when they're stuck in traffic with cars and buses, they can't move. Uh, and the Westerners came down and said, what you need is metro lines. Uh, six metro lines are now planned. One is under construction and they can't afford it. They can't afford to build this. They can't, it's a classic Western solution, which is way too uh, uh, engineering heavy, heavy and missing the culture and the nature of the place. So our proposition is pretty simple, which is if you take uh, and nobody's done this before, Severo did this for me. Um, we all know that a, a lane will carry a certain number of cars or buses or bikes or pedestrians. We know these kinds of things and you get up here to uh, uh, transit systems and this is why of course they're really efficient. But motorcycles per lane, if they were unimpeded by cars and buses would achieve around the same amount as a light rail and um, uh, most metro systems, 30,000 uh, vehicle person trips per hour in a motorcycle lane. So why build a metro line that you can't afford um, and that's elevated instead of just building more space and dedicating it just to motorcycles? And then if those motorcycles were electrified, which they have been now in China, you have probably the world's most efficient um, environmental transit mode ever invented, more so even than mass transit. Everybody gets to go exactly where they wanna go, when they wanna go. They have to have dedicated right of ways uh, and they have to have regulations for um, the step-by-step -step transition to electric uh, on these bikes. But all of a sudden you have a different Modality. So we're literally saying, stop building metro, start building bikeways, bike streets. The ecological systems, preserving um, the mangrove wetlands is key. And that's another dimension of where you direct growth. 
And then within the communities, this is one of the high ground areas. Um, this one holds around, uh, I think 800,000 population. Um, but within these communities, you have to have drainage and detention. This becomes a, the kind of green backbone of these new growth areas that are sitting in the right place uh, and can be easily serviced. Each community needs a drainage ways, both on street and in terms of open space networks. And so the paradigm for a new neighborhood uh, has intrinsic to it these green ways. Um, each new community needs to be walkable, mixed use, and more importantly, provide something that in the developing world we call sites and services. You accept the idea that people need economically to build their own home, but you give them decent environments to build them in. Places with sewer and water, electricity, roads and schools, but you still let them build their own place. And that needs to be integrated with a whole range of housing types that I can't spend too much time on. Finally, and then I'll conclude here, uh, heat island effect is another phenomena that we're just gonna have to deal with in cities. And the answer there is beautiful. It's just trees, trees, and more trees. And uh, I'm not so convinced by white roofs. Uh, and of course, we have all these complex studies about wind flow, but I think they're much more difficult to manage. The simple truth is green space and tree canopies are what these tropical uh, heat island environments need more than anything else. So this is just a, one of our little master plans as an exhibit for how they could choose to grow on high ground with ecological principles. And I'll just conclude very quickly by saying these are the, the, uh, the, the elements of the book, a chapter on preservation, both ecology agrarian neighborhoods, culture. The idea of preservation has to be the first step in thinking about the built environment. Uh, mixed use is universal. These are principles that apply in China, in Vietnam, in the United States. I defy you to design if you follow these simple uh, principles and their metrics, um, I defy you to end, end up uh, in situations as bad as we have today. The network of connectivity uh, and human scale in, in um, blocks and streets is key. A distribution of public space and it's all, all of its hierarchy is key. Uh, and the book will actually set out kind of minimum uh, benchmarks for each one of these. Walk bike, of course, is at the heart of all great communities. Uh, enhanced transit, whether it is um, a bikeway or um, an ART. Um, I think we're gonna move to the next generation of thinking about how mass mobility happens. And focus, this goes back to that idea of El Camino, uh, which is why not put density along in, in the form of ribbons as, a, as opposed to the form of hubs. So that's uh, kind of where I will end finally. Uh, this is what Churchill said, and it applies more so to cities. We shape our cities and thereafter they shape us. You think you're free, you are not. You are a product of the physical environment you live in. That's it. Uh, there's probably some more here, but I'm not gonna do them. How do I get out of this? Stop share. Okay, do we got any interesting questions? Uh, we have a few, Peter, but first of all, thank you for a really brilliant uh, talk that managed to cover a range of material. And with, as always, your California casual uh, <laughs> attitude uh, which presents uh, brilliant and urgent uh, solutions as totally natural. Mm. Uh, it's a great- They do talent. seem to be painfully obvious, don't they? Uh, all too. 
<laughs> so I will exercise privilege of the chair to open the questioning and then we'll try to catch up with some of the submissions, which uh, if you click on Q&A, you can see as well. Uh, so I just want to emphasize a couple of really important and um, uh, crucial uh, things that you, uh, again, totally rolled right off your tongue. Uh, one is, uh, and this is close to my heart, not starting from scratch every time, uh, but uh, encountering what we already have and trying to craft new solutions around uh, even the worst of strip-oriented development. Uh, our tendency to start all over again is a disaster. And also I second uh, your uh, second thoughts about light rail. Uh, I, I think you're spot on with new technologies of mobility, but also old ones like bikes in two feet. Um, uh, I happen to see one place we're working, uh, which is Gothenburg, Sweden, the home of Volvo, uh, some prototype uh, autonomous uh, vehicles uh, that respond on demand as you describe, uh, They're really impressive, but so quiet that you're walking along and they sneak huh. up on you. It's kind of creepy in an impressive way. Uh, but um, what I really want to ask uh, to get things rolling goes back to your uh, remarks about coalition building and the importance of that around multiple issues. Every four years, I ask my students to look for the platforms of the major American political parties in the area of urban policy. And of course, they find almost nothing because the Republicans have for many years written cities off or worse still rejected them. Uh, and the Democrats tend, therefore, to take cities for granted. Uh, but now we've got a perhaps historic opportunity to maybe change some things. So, uh, regrettably, uh, the new administration is not really yet talking much about affordable housing and uh, sprawl and mobility as you have, but their hot button issues we know are inextricably linked uh, to what you're working on. So climate change, uh, social and racial justice, creating green jobs are also obviously part of, an, uh, let's say, an expanded new uh, Green New Deal. 
how do you make those linkages so that uh, what's on the table also engages the urgent work that you've outlined? Um, geez, you know, with uneven success, the, we can demonstrate the shared benefits of great urbanism. And you can, you can hope that the environmental community will stop using uh, environmental pre preservation as an excuse for uh, opposing infill, which they too often do, at least in our, my part of the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you show that spectrum of impacts that we did in Mexico City or for the state of California, for example, and you can say that agriculture will be preserved, water consumption will be better, uh, more land, ecological lands closer to um, regional centers, um, more affordable housing for all. And I, I tend to call it now workforce housing, not affordable housing. I think that the idea that there are these two domains is a special kind of housing for people who don't have enough money and then there's all the other housing. No, right now there's a crisis in workforce housing. People with ordinary jobs can't afford housing in much of America, at least those parts of America with robust job opportunities. So let's call it what it is, it's workforce housing. Um, so I struggle sometimes to say, let's get the advocates for transit, the advocates for preserving open space and the advocates for um, uh, affordable uh, workforce housing and the advocates for equity together. And you can show that there's common cause. Does it always work? Not so much. I find the United States one of the more frustrating environments these days because the politics are so divisive and so dumbed down that nobody can really see these complex synergies that exist. Um, you know, the idea of taking El Camino not only works environmentally and in terms of workforce housing, but we did the numbers on the economics of it. Right now, the land produces a very low tax base. And the cities and the, the, the state of California are struggling for a reasonable tax base. And of course they go looking in people's income uh, returns. Uh, if that land goes 10X in value because you go in and you take out a parking lot in a single story building and you build you know, uh, 50 units per acre in an area where there's high housing demand, the property tax accelerates dramatically. And then you can bond against the property tax. You can issue bonds. And all of a sudden you've got money to spend on transit, on housing subsidies, on open space. And at least in our state of California where we're really cheap is on education. You know, in California, we spend under $10,000 per student. In New Jersey, it's $23,000 per student. I mean, it's an astounding, reversal for what was supposedly the most progressive place in the United States. But the property tax dimension of this is, is a whole nother way of thinking about things. Um, connecting the dots, we seem to lack the capacity to connect the dots. Now you go to, to Ho Chi Minh City and you just have a, a robust culture that is used to doing things a certain way. I guess the, the power of inertia is the greatest obstacle to problem solving, always. And so um, the inertia of the situation, the fact that there are sites that are already chosen and have uh, property values that accelerated because of the selection, even if they're underwater half the time, uh, it's just an astounding thing to look at. So yeah, there are, Lots of barriers, but I do think intrinsically the coalitions could be made, created and the dots could be connected. But I'm talking to you guys right now and there's on one side, you've got your environmental school. On the other side, you've got your design and urbanism school. And for some reason, they're not combined. They're not part of the same uh, pedagogy. And that is, you know, that's where the, the real trouble starts is when people become specialists.
And I look at my architect friends, I'll go on a rant here, and they just, they look at the world as a series of individual objects, buildings. Buildings are autonomous individual statements. They're not part of an urban fabric that contributes to the betterment of the whole. Uh, they have no modesty. Um, they all are seeking attention. And it's a tragic um, cycle. And so architects don't think clearly about it. Planners just think two-dimensionally. They never think three-dimensionally. And they aren't that well trained in environmental or economic factors. You know, I've often believed, Alan, that we need schools of, of uh, urban design because urban design is the one discipline that combines uh, the environmental factors, the economic factors, the, the, the placemaking factors and the social issues. It, you know, it is the meta uh, profession and lo and behold, it has no standing. It doesn't have a degree in any of any consequence anywhere. It doesn't even have a licensing exam. You can't come out of school and get an urban design license. You have to be a landscape or a, uh, you know, uh, an architect or an engine, just, you know, traffic engineer. You can be any specialization. You cannot be a generalist. Anyway, right. that's way, way too long. Uh, uh, our organizers should interrupt if we need to uh, stop. But it turns out that a lot of the questions are versions of the issue we're already talking about. How do you overlay solutions to multiple uh, challenges? How do you promote uh, the benefits of infill? One of the questions I asked that question at a policy level. One of the questions is asking it at a consumer level. How do we change people's attitudes about uh, where they live and how they live uh, to embrace uh, more compact even infill uh, solutions. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, you know, uh, we all live in our bubble and I live in this California bubble, the Silicon Valley bubble, and it's not normative, I'm, I will say, but the, the desire to live close to um, where the really significant opportunities are, the uh, desire to live in a walkable environment seems to still dominate the marketplace. Most developers who used to do big master plan communities uh, on green fields now understand that there's a huge market for infill housing, especially in places that intrinsically have that traditional street grid that connects everything, that has the, the foundations of urbanism as it once was, um, and you know the strip passes through those areas. It actually disrupts those areas. And so there's there's no shortage of builders and banks and uh, and and clients of people wanting to move into those those opportunities. We just can't produce enough of it. Um, I think in other parts of the country, the old paradigm of the streetcar suburb could really be reborn. And you know partly through incremental uh, revitalization of historic towns uh, and partly through uh, new communities. Uh, I'm, I, I've never believed you can say everything has to be one way or the other. But I do think we need to make that work. We need a new generation of transit. That's why I'm most excited about this idea of autonomous rapid transit. And let me talk about this for a minute. You know, people are, are excited by autonomy, but you know, whether a car has a, a steering wheel or not, doesn't matter. It does the same thing. As a matter of fact, if it's autonomous, it probably travels more miles because people will be comfortable commuting longer distance. They will probably get to wherever they're going and send the car, who knows how far to cheap parking, or maybe they'll send it all the way back home for somebody else to use. 
It's called deadheading. You know, it's when nobody's in the car. If we thought single occupant vehicles were bad, just wait, you see a bunch of zero occupant vehicles driving around. And the numbers, the analytics are pretty clear. The, um, it's up to about a doubling of vehicle mile travel per household because of autonomous vehicles. But if we use that technology on dedicated rights of way, like the BRT slash ART idea, all of a sudden it becomes more than benign because it's carrying multiple passengers and it's rarely going empty. Um, and it creates a fixed phenomena that urban form can organize itself around. If anything starts anywhere and ends anywhere, it's very hard to shape urban places that have any kind of hierarchy. So you need those dedicated right-of-ways. That's the essential. Uh, and whether you put electric bicycles or uh, autonomous vans, the bottom line is ge geography matters. And yeah. place matters. And uh, just to build on that, we've got a couple of questions about the relationship between generalized solutions uh, that make a lot of sense and also at the same time preserving some semblance of local uh, culture uh, building culture and relationship to landscape. Uh, obviously, you've been to Chongqing, uh, where that, it seems to me, is an enormous challenge. Yeah. The, the, yeah, this is, a, you, it, China is such a paradox. On the one hand, it is achieving things that most of, in the history of mankind we've never achieved, which is bringing people out of poverty. Uh, on the other hand, it's brutal in the way it shapes cities right now. But I do believe that's changing. Let me give you an example. In, in um, uh, another city, um, Kuming, uh, they had a huge area that they were planning for new growth. And they do need greenfield development because they are bringing in, the population is expanding so rapidly, they need receiving areas. And originally it was planned, and I did a bunch of the planning for it, and it was very good transit-oriented mixed use, and small city blocks was a huge revolution in their mind. Um, human scale streets and all that goes with it. Uh, they decided to rework the plan because uh, leadership decided that they wanted one third of the land for ecological preserves, one third for agriculture, and only one third for urbanism. And so they mandated a, a complex weave of ecology, ag, and urbanism in this area. And it's actually come out much better. That was a top-down policy that resulted. Do you see the Hutong, the traditional architecture and the traditional urbanism? Absolutely not. The idea of building at that density, um, it does happen in China. It is the worst of China in the sense that it's an economic elite that gets to have quote unquote villas and more and often than not, they'll shape them in more traditional ways. So uh, it's not like replicating the past is a possibility. Now I think a city block, I have a diagram of this, that has housing at the perimeter of various heights and has a courtyard is a modern interpretation of Hutong in the sense that the, it, there is an edge and there is a courtyard. And that's the fundamental taxonomy of the historic norm for Chinese cities. And of course the Hutong always faced south so that the courtyard get, got the light and the heat and courtyard, uh, courtyard city blocks can do the same. So there are ways of reinterpreting the past. Now, should they preserve uh, the historic Hutong? Um, that's even more difficult. The, the, the cost of renovating those environments and making them livable, and then the question is for whom, right? Who gets 
the, uh, the special privilege of living in low density housing uh, is so extraordinary compared to the economic need of taking care of people who are arriving from countryside from rural poverty. Um, I come down on the side of perhaps not. I know it's controversial, but it's a delicate balance. Yeah, it's a challenge. On my last trip to China, I saw some very good recent rural redevelopment at the village or town scale. Yeah. Uh, where quite modest uh, um, urbanism was being produced around uh, existing uh, vernacular landscapes and buildings. But uh, uh, the scale of that is so limited, obviously. Well, oh. reading one very interesting question, and it raises, you know, the question of, well, now everybody's going to work from home. Why do you have to be anywhere right. near anything? Um, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I think everybody's beyond restless and wants to be able to go someplace public and get out of the goddamn house. And so I, I don't think that's going to become the dominant way of living. It may mean, however, that uh, we work type space, having a, a small uh, satellite place to go and work that you can walk to may actually gain a lot of traction. So there's an in-between uh, just driving uh, 30 miles to work and s staying home and fighting over who gets to study space. Uh, and that is to have these common uh, workspaces close at hand. And I'll add to that image that it brings you right back to our historic norm of streetcar suburbs. Um, this idea that it's either bad sprawl or Manhattan has got to go. There is a sweet spot for America that we defined a long time ago, and it's still among the finest places to live. We're defined by that, and it's always low rise, it's mid density, it's just mix and human scale and walkability. So I'm coming to you this afternoon from uh, New Haven streetcar suburb. Yeah. Of circa 1915. Yeah. And uh, I've always loved it. Uh, Don't forget Alan. Alan, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't have the streetcar anymore, but we're uh, looking forward to your autonomous vans. All right. Uh, and on that note, Peter. No, no, I got a note that I have to finish on. Oh, good. Good. Because um, there are common roots here, and you failed to mention that actually uh, the one thing that bound the Congress for New Urbanists. Uh, um, advocacy together was a guy named Vincent Scully from Yale. And Vince, the one thing I got from my year at Yale was sitting with him and learning about streetcar suburbs and how traditional towns in America really had a, a great amount of value that has been lost. And he trained us all in that way of thinking. And uh, so he's the glue Indeed. that holds it all together. Indeed, uh, he should have the last word, but uh, I will, and it's uh, thank you. Thank you for your common sense, for your wisdom and your work. Uh, and we look forward to more. And a uh, personal thank you for your plug for urban design as an integrating discipline. A yeah. lot of us are thinking about that. Thank you, Peter. All right. And thank you, thank everybody you who to the today. audience. Yeah. So signing off. Bye, everybody. Okay.